Well, hey there, everybody. Hello, Joe Cardinal. How are you? Oh, I'm doing okay, although my butt's a little sore today and not from my normal weekend activities. This is, I've actually um, got a two hour bike ride in this morning. So I went out with uh, Sasha, pushed it a little bit further than I'd like. So going to have trouble sitting through this podcast, like I think most of our listeners, honestly, but. <laughs> yeah. And you're saying you're having somebody painting the house so there may be some background noise yeah some embellishments for our listeners they get to hear some character some interesting background fills and we may have nico coming in late today on the podcast uh you know now being the summer months basically it's going to be difficult to you know we're, we, we struggle to make uh you know to, to get coordinated here to do these these podcasts we don't get paid to do the podcasts so therefore, it's not like a job and everybody has other responsibilities. So it can be kind of hit or miss how, you know, when we can uh, arrange it, but we'll, we'll keep plugging away. We're closely approaching our one year anniversary. I think we got another month or so to go, I think August. But uh, other than that, yeah, the weather is nice. I'm looking out the window here. It seems relatively blue skies and uh, brutally hot in the 90s. Yeah, there is no more uh, spring anymore. It's you go from 40s to 90s now. It's it's. I remember it was always May and June were great. They were like in the 70s. It was just perfect out, you know. But uh, those days are few and far between now. You know, it goes right into August weather. It seems uh, right out of the gate. So uh, hopefully that's not a permanent situation. That that'll you know switch up. And you know, you mentioned and we didn't really talk before this. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, how we're not getting paid for that. And I think that's good for the listeners, you know, to kind of think about. And that I don't know if we're ready now, but we are going to eventually get, you know, a subscription service going. How, how's that coming along? Uh, pretty much it's, it's just ready. It, it's ready to go. I would have been able to have it done this week. <clears throat> Somebody's, you know, there's, I got things going on. So uh, we could shoot for either next week or we could just, I'd rather just, I always like to hold off till the first of a month. So that way I can keep track. So it's technically um, ready to go. All I would really have to do is put the links to sign up on the website and put up the sign up sheets. Uh, so let's shoot for the, you know, the, the first week of July, the weekend, you know, the 4th of July weekend thing. Man, that uh, was a great start. Well, we'll have two levels. One will be just a, you know, $5 a month, just goodwill donation to help us pay for the equipment that we've all had to pay for and keep things going. The other will be a uh, $10 a month where you'll actually get video, instructional video once a month. Uh, and of course it'll be a uh, work in progress, but yeah, we already have some video footage in the can. This is never before seen video on release. You can't get it anywhere else. And uh, you know, that'll be a recurring, you know, uh, monthly fee and uh, you know every month you'll get that video something to, to work on uh, and hopefully it'll inspire some guys to join the Tri-C program where we can continue with the with the distance learning and uh, you know things like that because that's uh, you know it's been a rough year for a lot of people you know year and a half almost and it's been exceedingly difficult for me because I've gone with without training anyone so I had zero income so for me you know, this is, this will be do or die. I've said it probably before, but this time it, it is. Uh, and my hands are cuffed a little, you know, the situation with my mom. I can't even go to the city and train like I was before the COVID with you guys. That's out of the question. I can't, I can't leave. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, dealing with that, dealing with her, dealing with my buddy and his, he's going through a breakup with his girlfriend. So I'm, you know, I'm one of the world's greatest experts on that. Uh, so I've been helping him with, you know, trying to keep him positive and supportive. And um, and now you you're are you settled in with your with your new home? I think mostly, yeah. It's for some reason it's not feeling as home right away to me as I would expect it. Um, you know, but again, I don't remember how long it took the past time. You know, maybe it takes longer for me to feel finally comfortable, you know, in a place. It's not that I'm uncomfortable, but just 
uh, you know, when you think about a place, you there's a place there's like where you live, and then there's a place that feels like home, you know. And I don't that know if I'm, that you had. I haven't been to this one, but that your previous house had a lot of character. Oh no, it was, it was a beautiful old 1920s home, um, you know. And we're still st staying in contact with the owners, um, and hopefully we'll be able to hook them up with um, one of my daughter's friends to actually rent it out. So we'll still have a connection with that house. And, you know, we're, we're keeping tabs with the owners because man, if that ever, if they're ever willing to sell it, that might be something we might jump on because it was a great location. You know, we like older homes. This is an older home too. Uh, and it's a lot more space. So when we have you out, you can check it out. You can kind of see why, you'll see why we made the move because it was not an easy decision, but I, I think it was the right one for sure. Um, but like I said, it's just kind of getting used to being in a new place. I think, you know, um, some, sometimes it happens quickly for me and other times, I guess not so much. So, um, I was thinking of a question to ask you kind of, this is kind of impromptu for this podcast. At least one of the theories we could talk about is hypothetically, let's say like in an ideal situation, if you were training or you were training someone for like a let's say MMA, but, but, but the ideal is that <coughs> they would be, it would be an ideal circumstance where you could be full-time access. So you wouldn't have to work, you know, like someone wouldn't have to work. So they were really, this was their focus. How would you lay out the training schedule? So like, I don't know if you've given this thought much, but like how, like, like how would a week look? How would a day look? You know, what days would you lift? What days would you run? That kind of stuff. I mean, well, you would, you would depend, well, the running is all based on your, output of sparring but you would do your road work uh, minimum three days a week in the morning yeah, ideally this is again like you're saying i guess yeah you know, little blank check kind of thing yeah do your road work come back eat your breakfast you know rest up um actually do a classroom kind of set like study study the theory and this is something i will touch on after we're done with this uh, this little portion of it, and then get your get your weightlifting in, um, and you know, and then again rest, and do some study throughout the day on theory and and strategies. And I'll well, I'll I'll tell you why now, I guess, because people, what at least what I see, they're they're automatons. Everybody fights the same way in a very small box. They're not thinking outside of the box. Like when somebody comes to train with me here, one of the first things I tell them, or I should, uh, and I do if we, you know, if the person's receptive to listening, is you have to develop your mind mentally and in two ways, power of the mind, you know, focus and all of that. But then learning how to forget what you see, forget how you see how these guys approach fighting because so many guys now, and I'm not talking about everybody, but it's so primitive. And there's so many different things that you can do that you have never seen before. So in my case, when I was learning the good and bad, I never saw any of this, this, this way of fighting. Nobody did. There was no YouTube. There were no videos. There was not nothing. All you saw was the, the phony pro wrestling and you saw the boxing. And if you, you, you never even really saw amateur wrestling on television. I don't recall seeing that. You only had three channels. I, mean, I don't remember ever seeing it except through the Olympics, and that was rarely covered. So I really didn't have any preconceived notions. I just saw how things went down in a fight in real life because I saw fights all the time. So I knew that like the martial art movies were hogwash, okay? That was fantasy, like a James Bond movie. So this would be an important part for people, again, getting back to your, your question, to open their mind to kind of like erase what you're seeing and, and look at, the, at a bigger picture. And then in the afternoon, you do your technique, you know, you, you, you work at that. And how long is again, completely dependent on the person's level of fitness, because as a coach, the minute that person is gassed, you got to stop. Okay. You just, you have to. You, you can no longer go forward with those types of techniques because they don't have the physical ability anymore to do it that day, okay? So everything is going to be sloppy and uh, you're just gonna, bad muscle development, you know, the bad technique is gonna happen. And same with 
when you're trying to instruct them theoretically, they have to be paying attention. You you can't you can't go four hours. The people's attention span isn't there. You got to take things in smaller chunks, maybe 45 minutes or maybe an hour if you're lucky. Um, so yeah, that's how I would do it. You know, diet is very important too. And again, that's nobody can, you know, it depends what, what weight is the guy, how many calories is he burning out that day? So, you know, you'd have to factor all of that in. And then one of the biggest things that a lot of people don't want to talk about is rest. You got to get sleep. You got to get a good night's sleep. So you don't want to be, you know, working out 16 hours a day, you know, and, and not really sleeping much. So it takes, in my opinion, Joe, uh, everyone that I know that has excelled, be it an athlete or be it a musician uh, in my world, they're used to a routine. They're, they're not one of these types of people that it's always like, show me something new, show me something new, show me something new. Those are the types that tend to fail there's routines that you have to do exercises be it musical exercises or physical exercises that you just have to get accustomed to doing and yes to the outside world it can become boring or monotonous but that's how you build the foundation man you know um you, you can't dabble you know you really got to dive all the way in so yeah that's really how i would that's that's how i would do it uh it's not very difficult, you know, it, it's, you know, probably eight, six, six hours, eight hours total, you know, um, when you factor in the rest periods and everything and, uh, you know, lunch and dinner, you, you can't go much longer than that. I mean, let me drill in some details here. So on the road work <clears throat> start of the day, you know, I've heard different ranges. Obviously you could, clearly do too little or too much. So what are kind of the ranges you would think a, a good fighter should work between? Well, you, what do you mean by ranges? Uh, well, let's say like if I'm only running like one, maybe, oh, actually we're being, Nico's joining in and this would be uh, good for him to jump in too, so. Well, three miles, no more than six. I mean, it, again, it depends on y y the road work is just a section of your conditioning it's it's just part of it it goes along with everything else you know uh if you're doing bag work if you're doing if you're running stairs if you're um you know doing like the lucky 13 kind of stuff you know where you're actually doing other kind of exercises mm -hmm. um to help your conditioning but but the, like stuff like the lucky 13 is is not just for cardiovascular it's to help develop your explosiveness um Oh, he changed his name, huh? To Nikoi. Nikoi. We'll have to ask him about that. Yeah, well, you never know. Changes, you know. There, there was a song. Who did that song? Was it uh, Steely uh, uh, Nicks? Changes, Fleetwood Mac, or whatever. How you doing, Nico? Hey, what's up, guys? All right. So we're just you're jumping in the middle of this. So basically, yeah, I would do, uh, you know, but there are limits. Like, you know, can you do you just want to jog? If you're just out jogging, okay, for whatever reason, okay, maybe you're just tired or just a variety, then if you're just jogging and you're going to have a light day in the gym, then go six miles, right? But if you really want to work that explosiveness, cut it down, do three miles, but sprint jog, sprint jog, sprint jog, throw in some uh, sprawls, throw in some jumps along the way, some bounding exercises and everything, you know, so mix it up. So it's about output that way. You know, um, I want guys to be explosive. That's, that's, that's really important. And again, I'm talking drug free here. This, when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, so many athletes are, are on performance enhancing drugs, that changes everything. Okay. Cause their recovery period is, you know, they have less of a time. They, they, they need less time to recover. So they can, they can do things that a, a natural athlete can't do, okay? So I approach things strictly drug-free. So if you're on drugs, don't even bother. I don't want to train you. You know, I'm, I'm a natural guy. So come, 
come to me all natural and I can get you, you know, to your peak. So I don't like to paint with a broad brush or I like to paint with a broad brush though, and not be specific because everyone is different. You know, I would train you probably different than I would train Nico based on your size, your age, you know, your physicality. Um, you know, you Nico or not Nico, but Joe, I, you really, I have to work more on your explosiveness. A guy like Joe Dankowski, the man's like a gun, like a bullet coming out of a gun. He's got, He's got a lot of explosiveness, right? So I would work on other things with him. You know, I focus on other things to make sure that his explosiveness doesn't diminish. You know. Yeah, Tony. When you when you bring up recovery for the training, to me that's like ultra important. Especially like as I get older, it seems like I don't recover as well. And with with your workouts, you know, I've done a lot of like high intensity workouts, all different kinds. But I noticed with the, with the ones you gave me, I can recover extremely fast from them, and they're and they're very hard, very high intensity. So for me, that's like that's like the ultimate. You know, if I could train really hard and recover really fast, that's that's the best. And well, and I think I don't I don't know if it's because it's a lot of body weight stuff, but no, it's the way I structured it. And I'll explain. Um, thank you for the compliment. What what I do is when you're quote unquote, in your recovery, like during the, the training aspect, when you're doing the certain exercises and I let you kind of slow down every time I try to make that re your like rest period, let's call it shorter and shorter and shorter. See, that's the key. It's you want to um, retard the amount of time it takes you to recover in a fight. Okay. So you want to be able to catch, as they call it, your second win, but it'll be your third, fourth, fifth, sixth win if the fight's extended. You want th those periods to be very short. So what you, you got to work on it two ways. Number one, the amount of time that you can go full blast, you know, high energy, you want to try to expand that. And consistently, you want to try to narrow the length of your recovery time. So yeah, that's how come, you know, the whole, the whole point of what I was training you guys in is to shorten your recovery, make it so man, yeah, you feel ready to go again. Uh, there's, and there's no timetable on that. You know, with you, Nico, you may be able to get fitter or fit quicker than Joe or Joe vice versa. But yeah, it's, it's, that's what it's all about. Um, looking in this, you missed the part when I was talking about changing your mentality, how you look at fighting and, and, Yet the people also have to change their mentality on, on how they look at training because, you know, the way, again, the way training is your conditioning is not designed necessarily to set world records unless that's all you want to focus on. Like Paul Dodds ended up focusing on my fitness and he set a, you know, a few world records in fitness. Your fitness is with me. The training is designed to make you a better fighter. You know, not make you an 800 pound bench presser, but, you know, to make you a better fighter. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's all about that. But that's, again, a part of it. But the recovery and the rest at night, you have to get a good night's sleep consistently. You, you can't be going like I go on three or four hours of sleep at night. You can't do that. Your body, your mind won't work. So it's, it's, it's a big picture. And, and your diet plays a role in it as well. So other than that, let's, how you been, Nico? Good. Let's so your, your beard out and shit. Yeah. I actually had an incident um, this week. We were on a job and this sounds crazy. This has never happened on a job before, but we were pouring an auto zone up in Waukegan. And as we were pouring the concrete, um, we seen guys just came running through a gangway, went running right past where the, the concrete truck was pouring under the chute and it was uh, two cops chasing a guy and the cops were like winded. The guy was getting past them pretty good. And they tell us, go stop him. So me and my cousin ran after the guy. We both had concrete boots on <laughs> and uh, he, the guy, the guy made a turn. He was running towards like a busy street. So I took, I took like a left hand route. Cause I figured he's, he's going to turn left. He had to turn, 
you know, one way or the other. He actually turned right and he ran into the concrete truck driver and he was standing out there. And then my cousin just grabbed him, took him down like super quick. And the cops cuffed him up. But uh, that was pretty cool. I mean, my cousin's a good wrestler and definitely was a skill that came into good use. Well, yeah, I'm glad you're safe. You know, it's uh, sad the cops had to call for your help because, you know, if something went wrong. Oh, it is terrible. I mean, it's, yeah, it's you know, were pathetic. Yeah, well, that we've talked about that before, you know, that, you know, and this is why many of them end up, you know, relying on their gun because other aspects of their thing is just, you know, you know, not good enough. But anyway, I, I don't know these guys, but my whole point is, you know, you got to watch for lawsuits, man. You just do. You know, everybody's so crazy. And, you know, if your cousin or you would have injured, let's say, the, the guy running away, who's who's liable now? You know, you, I, it's tricky. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm a good Samaritan. You're a good Samaritan. But these are things that I've always told people that you have to be prepared for. You know, you you have to have your shit already in order, you know. Uh, in your personal life, so that you're not, you know, on the on the hook uh, for this stuff. Um, well, good for you, man. I'm glad everything. I, I wonder what he was arrested for. Yeah, I, we, we never found out. You know, I was so just assuming it was. Thank you or something? Or? No, they didn't say nothing. They just said, all right. They, they just coughed him up and they said, all right, thank guys. We got it from here and that's it. That. They didn't thank us, and they definitely would not have got that guy without us. Yeah, he would have well, got away. So I actually, I kind of, kind of felt a little bad for the guy. It was like, he's having a bad day. He's trying to get away from the cops, and he runs past three wrestlers, and the cops tell us, go get him. It's like, what are the odds of that? Well, they don't call you a catch wrestler for nothing. You caught the guy. So, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's just disappointing that, you know, I, I look at some. I'm really surprised had, that they asked for a civilian to get involved. That seems pretty risky. Oh, yeah. It, it's actually it's a little pathetic. I mean, they were the cops were completely winded. We ran way faster than them with concrete boots and work boots on. So, yeah, I think it's a little bit uh, telling of the. Uh, exercise programs they have for these cops but just to tony's point the legality of it you know i don't know yeah you know and yeah when push comes to shove if leah let's say i mean hopefully they've got your back like when that you know if, if, if you went to court or something saying, yeah we told them to do this but god you never know you know how it's going to play out um you know and especially if like let's say we don't know what they're running from he he's gonna out? pull the gun on you, you well, know? yeah we didn't we knew nothing i i thought the guy was going to pull a shank or something he could have, or a gun, mean, or anything. Yeah, I mean, he's a big gangbanger looking dude. Um, you know, and he's if he's running from the cops, who knows what he's got on him and what he'll do to get away. So, yeah, it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunate. That's a position that you shouldn't have. It have been well, you weren't, you know, you weren't prepared for that. Well, who who does? You're at Warwick, that, and that's another thing. That, yeah, that was like a completely took me off guard like i mean just totally unexpected yeah i mean shit i mean imagine if you know this could have actually gone south and, and cost you your job um yeah it's just kind of funny because i was talking to this guy that i know that's a bartender and i said hey because some bar owners are, are funny but i said hey you have the power to throw somebody out right to bar them out of here and he's like well yeah but he says my the owner doesn't want to put any of us at risk. So there's a button underneath certain parts of the bar. It's like a hot, hot wire to the police. You know, you press the button and, you know, the cops come. So, you know, there's an owner who at least cares enough about his clientele to say, hey, or his uh, employees to say, hey, I don't want to see anything happen to you. If, if, if the situation's out of hand, you hit the buzzer, you know, get the cops involved. Um, you know, yeah, it's a it's a sticky wicket, man. It's you know, it's one of those gray areas. But that's that's surprising that that in a hot pursuit, they're they're asking for your help. I don't. That's mm. 
know, it's interesting. You mentioned the button under the desk. Now at my work, um, they have it. There's a software on all the computers. There's a certain key combination you can hit that will immediately signal the security department. It'll say what computer it is, where it's at, and, and that there's violence going on so that they, you know, you don't have to pick up the phone and call them basically that they've educated, they've implemented this now because, you know, even in, I said, well, I work in a healthcare environment, but you know, there's always kind of domestic things that can break out. You know, you never know what's going to happen or someone who's upset about a bill or, you know, bad news. So, um, but yeah, having something like that in place, granted, you know, this, this is a bigger place that I can afford to put something like that in. Um, but I think that's, I think that's good for, you know, any kind of employer to have, have safety protocols in place for if something does happen, especially, you know, when you're interacting with the public. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And you don't get paid for hazardous duty. Um, you know, yeah, anything can happen, but you, yeah, you shouldn't be exposed to having to deal with that. Uh, it's not in your job description. And then conversely, there's other places like I've heard Home Depots or something like that, where you're not allowed to, if a shoplifter gets out of the store, you can't go after the shoplifter again for liability issues and so on. And then, you know, there's two sides to that. There's people like, well, you know, if you can apprehend the person, you, you should. But it, it's, it's something that I don't have to worry about because I'm not in that world. If I see something going on at a store, I'm not employed by that store, so I can choose to do what I want to do and face the music, um, you know. Uh, but regardless, you got to know what to do if you try to apprehend somebody. You know, everybody, a lot of people want to be a hero, and then they end up regretting trying to be the hero. You know, I have enough confidence in you, Nico, that you 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 trained enough that you know you'll be able to deal with you know most people, but. There's a lot of guys out there that wouldn't be able to deal with a serious situation, you know, when it goes beyond MMA, beyond a grappling match. When, like you said, there's a shank or a weapon of, of some sort, um, or just a guy who's, you know, pretty skilled or intense on something, you know. You know, you mentioned the shoplifting thing. I had a buddy who worked at a jewel on the north side of the city. That's a grocery store for those people who don't. Um, but back in the day, and I think he said this was like early 80s, maybe 70s, but if there was a shoplifter, all the stock boys would chase them out. Like, like, like if someone would make a go for it, they would all chase him down. And eventually he uh, chased some guy two blocks and the guy, he actually got cut. The guy had a box cutter. You know, he tried to, um, you know, restrain the guy and the guy was armed. He didn't even think about it. And he got cut. He actually did, was able to restrain the guy, but you know, and, and a lot of times like in Nico's situation, you may not even see that they're pulling something, you know, you're just, you get so close so quick, you know, that you miss out, but actually because he got cut pretty good, uh, that's when they changed the rules. And they said, Hey, you know, if the guy's just st stealing, you know, armfuls of groceries, let him go, you know, call the cops and deal with it later. But back in the day, it was just like, it was kind of, you know, the employees, they just kind of had an unwritten rule that they would try and chase these guys down. And uh, yeah, but he had, like I said, he had literally got cut by one of those guys by a box cutter, you know, in the altercation. Yeah, he, well, if he was on the north side, he was probably living in a good neighborhood. So he wasn't exposed to a lot of street crime and how it went down. Back then, he, well, I say back then because that's when I was a kid in the 70s and I saw all this. I, almost, I don't remember ever not seeing, I don't ever remember see, seeing a fair fight, ever. Okay, meaning just one on one guys doing it out, you know, uh, unless they were old timers, right? But it was always multiple assailants or weapons involved. And, um, and it wasn't always guns, but there was always a, the potential of that because everybody, there was guns were around. So it's a whole different approach. And that's even why, like, what, when I, like, you know, the ripping and the, the different approach that would make your techniques pretty useless. All this effort that you put in to get your black belt and then you find out one simple little counter nullifies everything you've ever done. You've, you've seen, you've had that happen to you, Joe. You've been the nullifier. You've been the guy that, have done, that, has, that, has, that has done stuff purely accidentally. And you know, if it was a real fight, you would have won instantly, you know that on more than one occasion. And this is what I have to try to pound into people's heads. You know, you, you know, you don't, you don't know. 
because you're not allowed to see these things. They're forbidden in, in competitions. So you get a self f false sense of security. So anyway, uh, other than that, um, yeah, it's just been a long six months now. We're halfway through the year. It's been a long six months for me. So were we going to, was today going to be a discussion about Rodvon again, or was that going to be well, a different I mean, time? We could, I mean, I just wanted to touch on, you know, that the guy, you know, he had this, I don't remember now because you know, my memory is so poor. I don't remember everything we discussed when we had it, the show the last time about him, but I don't remember even talking about the coin bending and things that he could do that people say, oh, you can't do that. There's a couple strong men that have bent coins that I'm aware of, um, but never like to his degree. Uh, <clears throat> you just don't understand when you have that kind of grip and finger strength. It's beyond grip strength. It's finger strength. What that means, you know, uh, how you could grab, he could grab your nose and just crush it or, you know, just grab things and just, you know, like a, like a chimpanzee, you know, maul you. Um, there's a lot to that. Okay. That kind of strength, that kind of freak stuff back then in the seventies, especially. <clears throat> and even before that, Guys had longer hair, not like even hippie long, but just, you know, guys would not, not like you now, Nico, your kind of haircut was extraordinarily rare. Okay. And like Joe's maybe like Joe's a little yeah, longer Joe's or even mine, you know, just something where you can grab and, you know, to, to literally get your hair ripped out. Cause that's, what's going to happen. I mean, this, this is all you know, crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, but his strength, his hand strength, I, I like to focus on, focus on his arm and hand, hand strength. Uh, it was just uh, frightening, okay? As I said, I've never seen him weightlift kind of thing, you know, squat or anything, power lift or whatever. Um, that wasn't the thing. Um, but did he, was, did, oh, I'm sorry. Did he do overhead presses, like press kegs or stuff like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. He, I, he did the Olympic-style lifts, and, yeah, he would lift things over his head all the time, you know, um, when he was younger. And I think he even did stuff like that in his, uh, um, strength shows, but I saw a picture he had. a Okay. So he had a, a plank, not very long plank might've been, Oh, for those who are on radio and not listening or not watching the video, maybe 18 inches long, something like that. And it was probably, I don't know, eight inches wide and he held it up right underneath his, his chin like this with just his hands and his arms were like like imagine curling curling up and he had a guy standing on that plank on the edge of the plank the amount of leverage of that that's psycho stuff that's crazy that kind of grip that leverage strength um so this, this is a guy that you know you're not going to wrist lock like Japanese style wrist lock. You're not going to, you know, you, you, you're not going to muscle him and get an arm lock. Okay. And he worked on tendons and, you know, so we could fight straight arm bars and, you know, we, I could do, you know, all of this, but he, you, you know, this was one of those types of guys that was, you know, really like freakish, you know, the, the strength was so incredible. And to his um, credit, he was a master technician with the submission holds. He didn't just use strength. Um, but I think because of him being so strong, that's why he really wanted me to become a technician. He really wanted me to have the techniques at the highest level because, I mean, no offense to anybody out there, please, but he used to always say he, he can blow through any judo, as that was the big thing back then, judo and jujitsu, but meaning the Japanese style. He could blow through their locks. They, it was like as if they were nothing. Um, and, and that's what the thing was even in wrestling. They used to call it breaking holds. You could just break out of people's holds. Uh, and he just, it was, it was frustrating for me as a student 
you know, when I, because I, I knew when he was letting me, and then I knew when he when he wanted to get out, he we, he would get out until I got things right. And boy, when I got him right, and he was nailed to the cross, as we used to say, boy, then I started saying, hey, I'm getting somewhere here. So that's why I'm a stickler for this stuff. Uh, you know how I get, man. You know, I get like, nope, not good enough. Nope, nope. You're missing this. You're missing those little details. That's part of the thing when you watch videos, you don't get all the details. You just don't. That's why the try c thing, the actual lessons are, you know, interactive lessons are so important because I can take the time to say, no, you're not doing it right. You've got to add more, 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 you know, or whatever. So, uh, yeah, just with the strength, man, that just was, and I had always admired strength because I was a smaller kid, you know, not strong. So I, like to this day, I admire strength, but not like I did as a kid, because I know more about strength now than I did as a kid. You got guys out there now that are over 400 pounds, strong men, you know, I don't, awesome guys, man, probably the strongest men in, of all time now, but that's too big. You know, I want to be functional. You know, I want to be the size I am and have that strength so I can have speed and I can have endurance and, you know, not be, I don't want my body to end up working against me. And Ravon was never gigantic when I knew him. He wasn't that massive that he couldn't move, you know. So, Tony, what, what did he bend for coins? Did he bend quarters? Yeah, he bent half dollars, silver dollars, and I've seen him bend quarters, half dollars, and silver dollars. And honestly, the silver dollars and the half dollars and silver dollars to him said they were easier because they were, even though they're thicker, is he had the strength. Okay, two things on that. First of all, the leverage was easier. It's a bigger, bigger object. But the key, this, the trick was you, well, there's not a trick, but you, you, you got to toughen up your, you got to callous up your fingertips. Okay. Especially your thumbs because they're, they're, you know, if you push your thumb tips, there's give, well, you can't have that. All right. Um, you got to toughen them up and you actually have to make them so callous that you, you don't, you know, not only doesn't give, but you don't have that pain. Um, there was a story, some guy wrote in a, one of the papers in Cleveland that, as he got older and his strength was going, finally, they, he would sit at the restaurant and just force himself until his fingers were almost bleeding, or maybe they were bleeding, to try to bend the coin still. So even towards the end of his life, that was the big thing. And I, I'm sure when he, when he struggled to bend coins, that's probably, mentally for him, it was probably very debilitating. Like, the, the most precious thing I have is my strength, and it's finally ebbing, it's leaving me. Um, but yeah, he used to do, like I say, quarters, half dollars and silver dollars. And I knew somebody that had a half dollar. I think it was a half dollar or a silver dollar. She used to carry around that he bent for her. And, uh, you know, I used to see him do the coins not regularly, but quite often. Um, it was pretty cool, man. And fast. I mean, it didn't take him a long time. He didn't struggle. I'd say he, when I saw him bending the quarters, uh, let's see, probably two to three seconds. That's it. Um, wow. I can't imagine what he could do when he was younger because I got him at the tail end when he was already 70 and 70 and 70 plus, you know? So um, yeah, I can't imagine what he was, well, you know, before. I guess he used to break coins, you know, bend them back and forth, play with them until they snap, you know. Um, I never saw that, but, you know, others have done that in, in previous, but he was doing it with not coins from 1910, you know, or 1920, where the comp composition of those coins are probably different, or European coins that may be, you know, different, brittle, who knows. He was doing it with, you know, U.S. currency, man. You said he did something with a um, with a broom, right? Where he could pinch it and hold it with just his two fingers from the edge. Yeah, yeah not unlike a weaver stick where you grip it. Yeah, he could pinch it, you know, um, and leverage it out. <clears throat> it it's difficult. I mean, because most guys can't do like 
beer bottles are tough, right? Or w wine bottles, um, which, you know, I was able to do all that, but um, pinching the, the, uh, the broom, you have to do it, but you got to start moving further and further away, longer handle and shit. That's where it gets tough. Uh, these are things you have to work up to. These are fun things. But again, too, you have to watch I me. Mean, you don't want to injure your hands. You, you got to go slow, you know, gradual with things. You, you can get injuries. I was going to kind of ask that. Did you notice any, was there any trade-off for him? Was there any lack of fine motor skills or any, did you ever notice anything like arthritic or anything with his hands where he's like, okay, he's, and it could just be natural with age, but just the fact that kind of like we talk about, if you're a super muscular guy, big, you know, there's trade-offs, like you might lose some flexibility, but with the hands, you know, those fine motor skills. Did you notice anything like that with him? Well, I, yeah, I don't think I did. You're asking something that happened, you know, 40 some years ago, 45 years ago. Um, and, and yeah, I, I can honestly say, I don't remember that. Okay. I don't remember him having, I, I remember him having difficulty walking, you know, limping and things that I remember, cause that was very obvious, but the hands, I don't recall ever that, that ever happening. Um, I don't remember him complaining about anything with his hands. So no, I'd have to say no, not with the hands, but for sure with his knees or legs, or whatever. Yeah. Of course I have that too, you know, my legs. Did he, did he have any kind of special workouts he did for his fingers and hands? Well, I thought we discussed this before. Yeah. I mean, he would like the rolling up of the, of the paper and, uh, uh, squeezing objects, lifting thick handled objects, uh, lifting weights with individual fingers with string in different directions. That probably was the, the main secret, um, you know, and uh, <clears throat> a few other things that, you know, maybe one day I'll, I'll make a video on it or something, you know, uh, so I can demonstrate it. <clears throat> All the exercises that he did, I'd have to get material together you know the, the props that you know the, the some of the stuff that he did but i think at one point i probably had the strength in my fingers to bend a coin i really probably did but i couldn't get those fingers calloused enough kevin was able to horizontally um grind away a little bit of a quarter and then I was able to bend that. And Kevin used to make these, he was a tool and die guy. So I would get his scrap slugs. I used to have a ton of them, like maybe hundreds of them that were about the size of a quarter. And I would try to bend them. And the thinner ones I could, and then as they got thicker, I had a problem with it. But the point was to practice to just all about callousing up my thumbnails. I mean, my, uh, the thumb tips. Okay. Which, I just ended up abandoning it because I'll tell you, man, that was painful. It, it was really tedious and, you know, um, bottle caps was another thing that I, now that you just, it dawned on me that he used to tell me to practice bending. Um, Cause back then, you know, with the pop bottles and then practice bending them. And I used to do those. I could still do those bending them two ways. One with just one thumb and then bending them backwards, which is harder. Um, and that you got to watch cause you'll cut your, your fingers up because of the uh, corrugation on the uh, the pop bottle. Um, but yeah, I uh, I couldn't believe that kind of strength. And yeah, I used to dream about bending coins. You know, I really did. That was the one thing that just eluded me. But so I said, okay, I'll work on the rest of my arms at least, get my arms strong. That I was able to do. You know, I had my arms you know, as you guys know, with the, with the curl record and all that stuff, I had my arms way up there as far as strength. So I was happy with my arm strength. And I think I did probably about as best as I could do. Okay. Maybe, maybe I could have went another percent or two, but I, I went as about as good as I could do. So I don't, I don't complain, but this guy, man, he is just at a different level. I don't know what to say. It's just, there's people like that you know, in all walks, you know, there's just guys who are, and gals who are just super exceptional at something. He was one of those guys. But technique wise, I thought I was with him. You know, I was able to even show him things. I would create stuff, come up with moves or ideas, which was the whole point, which is how most musicians are. 
they'll end up showing their teachers something or they'll do stuff that their teachers, you know, are like wowed by. That's the whole point, really, in a good teacher. You know, a good, a good teacher or coach wants you to exceed, wants you to, ex you know, go beyond what he or she has shown you and and open up your own mind. That That's the goal of, of if your coach always wants you to be worse than him, then he's not a coach, okay? That, and not in my book. A true coach wants everybody better than he or she is. I just couldn't overcome his strength. There, that's one. You know, all the techniques is one thing, but he had that hand strength that I I've never seen anybody like it. I'm not saying there aren't anybody out there. I'm just saying I've never met people stronger than him with the hands and the arms. So what was what was Rod Vaughn's personality like? I mean, I know you mentioned it briefly, but did he ever joke around with you, or was he always completely serious? Well, he didn't, he didn't joke. That just, he just, I mean, I'm not going to say he never, ever, ever, ever laughed. No, it just wasn't his thing. That wasn't his personality. There's, you know, I've, I'm sure you've seen a lot of guys like that. If Well, maybe, I don't know you that well, Nico, but if you've been around old timers and you got to remember there was a 60 year age or 55, 60 year age difference between him and I, okay, roughly. So that even made things, because I did not find, it was a different time. It was a different era. No, he was not a jokester. You you, you would never prank him. You would never do, don't even think that, okay? Uh, no, he did not have that kind of, that was in his personality. At least not with me, it wasn't. And I, I don't think it was in general. <coughs> so, but I've known other people like that, that just don't have that sense of humor. I was a smart ass. Okay. So I was always a smart ass, practical joker kind of guy. And that I had to learn to, to, I couldn't do that with him and with others. You, you, you had to, I had to tone it down, which was, which was tough. So I couldn't really be myself. I remember you describing some lighthearted moments with him. Not that he was a joking, but kind of, or you could get a, a glimpse into some personality there um like where he's talking about well how much you know does this person know well, he only knows this much and this other guy he only knows this much and then you're like well how much do you know well, i know everything you know but that to me it seems like you know uh, not necessarily you know clearly there's some personality there some you know lightheartedness maybe and maybe it was just yeah he wasn't he was an sociopath man you know i'm not saying that you know but i'm just saying that what i consider a sense of humor is different. I'm way out there with the with the pranks and the you know making people laugh and poking fun. He he you know all not mean spirited, but he's not like he was not like that. He also had kind of maybe a subtle artistic flair about some of the training. Like I was I was just thinking about him uh, this spring because the old house I was at was right near a Catholic church, and I've never seen this before. But you know, it's a Catholic church and school. And so different houses in front of their houses, they put out, I don't know, little shrines or little, you know, settings for stations of the cross, right? So like, as you'd walk to the church, they would have the different, you know, and I'm not Catholic, so I don't know all, all the different stations, but this is, you know, but he put you through a stations of the cross too, right? So like he translated, like, to me, there's a little bit of, you know, I don't know if I would call it humor, but definitely you know, he was putting holds on you and calling them the stations of the cross, correct? Yeah, the 12 stations of the cross, I think it was, you know, yeah, and because I was an altar boy and we he was a staunch Catholic and well, actually, so was I back then, you know. So yeah, that was just, I don't think that, yeah, that was definitely not to be humorous whatsoever. He wasn't even trying to be blasphemous. He was trying to relate, you know, um, and, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a way, kind of equate that Jesus is suffering, you know, emulate that you're going through the sufferings that you know that christ went through kind of thing so um that i think had more of a religious kind of uh overtone to it uh again i don't know i i that that was just my my impression of it and it yeah it was rough man you know it was just it, the the training as i said I don't know. I just don't know if it can be done today. Okay. 
without, if I tried to do it, I would probably be brought up on charges of some sort. I, I could see it, you know, um, or just people would be like, no, you're too crazy, man. You're too nuts. You know, we're not going to, we're just too hard. It's, it's, it's too scary. But I was living in a scary environment. And so I had nothing to lose. It was either lose my life on the street or go through this stuff, you know, to try to not lose my life on the street. So, the, so, so this, believe me, if this, let's say I was raised in Beverly Hills or something where, you know, totally safe. And I just wanted to become, you know, I wanted to win some grappling tournament. Well, number one, I don't, he wouldn't probably have trained me, but even if he did, let's just say he did. I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have went through all of that because it wouldn't have been worth it. Okay. It wouldn't have been, it would be like, what's the point? Why are you torturing me? You know, guys in tournaments can't do this to me. So why are you doing it to me? That's my point. In the street, guys would do worse if, if given the chance. So his whole thing was, I want the worst of your, your beatings or experiences to happen here in the gym. So everything else on the street will be minor compared to this. And that I appreciated. And I knew, you know, I wasn't going to die unless it was an accident with him. Um, but I figured I could die going to school. And that's another thing I want to tell people, especially younger people, Nico's age. All of us back in that era that didn't have these luxuries now that so many kids have. Mommy and daddy driving them everywhere. Soccer moms, this, school buses, this. We didn't have that. We just simply, the only time I actually had a school bus was when I was in ninth grade in all boys school. Outside of that, there was no school buses. I walked to school, okay? Or I had to take public transportation to school or um, drive a car to school. You know, there was never any school buses ever. And so we, and you know, we were just on our own. And not just me, I was like the only kid, all of us. And I think people lose track of that nowadays. And then, you know, people may judge, how could those, how could those families back then do that? Well, they did do that. That's just how it was. You know, we, as societies change, you know, times change. I'm not judging anybody or anybody else's family. I don't know everybody's family, what, if they worked or whatever, but, you know, we just did what we did. It was rough. It was, it was, it was very difficult times, man. It was, it was very difficult times stressful and uh you know it's shit that stays with you forever so let's get on something lighthearted because you always guys always get me on a sunday especially um let's talk about some good stuff what do you got something good to say joe uh well i got to see a buddy uh i haven't seen in several months because of all this covid lockdown so i got to hang out with him hung out kind of late actually on uh a friday night um which was cool. So getting to see and just the impression, everything's opening back up. Actually, it was crazy. I drove um, Ben downtown first to, uh, we, we stopped by Haley's place, my daughter, his sister, take some pictures for her. But man, the city now, because, you know, this is like summer times too, because, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody's kind of got the masks off and every, well, not everybody, but basically it's, you know, all that pent up energy. You can just feel it like going through this, the city is just jammed with people now on the weekends, which could be plus, like I said, it was tough getting around, but it was kind of cool to see everything back to life again. You know, it's really like springtime coming alive again. Well, yeah, as of five days from now, Chicago is going to open back up or not Chicago, Illinois, in you know, total, the whole state. So no more restrictions for the most part. Everything is going to be OK. They say, you know, I'm, I got both of my vaccines. So I did all, all I could do, you know, um, I'll still carry a mask in case some, I go somewhere that, you know, requires it, I'll have it, it's not a big deal. I mean, I'm only in a store for, you know, short time. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of strange. It does seem strange. But a lot of places closed and not all, only because of the COVID. I mean, they were struggling before the COVID. Um, this is just an absolute fact, and I think COVID a lot of times, or in some instances, excuse me, was the nail in the coffin, but, you know, the economy, I don't care what anybody says, wasn't rocking and rolling like they were trying to tell you, at least not in the places that I went to, because 
so many joints closed and places you wouldn't think like even now like laundromats and you know like they're closing up and things how does that happen right so um we'll just see what 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 goes down i'm not a psychic So I'm just curious, Tony, and I, I, I know you want to change the subject, but I'm curious to know, like, what was Rod Bond's, like, home life? Like, was he, did he live alone? Did he, did he have yeah. um, well, family, he had, grandsons, or? Yeah, he had kids that I never knew of until after he was dead. He never even talked about that. And apparently what I found out, so, found out, so he was alone. So what I found out subsequently was that he his kids left when uh they were relatively young i don't i don't want to say like i don't know how old they were but they split to like i think it was california way out west and rodman was extraordinarily private okay there was just things that you just he didn't talk about to, forget about me because i was just a punk kid but to even his contemporaries people that knew him right a lot of people didn't really know him didn't know all the details about him and stuff. Um, but yeah, so he did have some uh, kids. I don't know if he had grandchildren or that. I don't, I don't know any, any of that. But I did not know he even had kids until after he was, uh, you know, uh, dead. But that, that's just unbelievable. Was he a widower or just no, single? No, divorced. Oh. Yeah. Which again, too. I don't want to get it. I'm not, I don't want to speak on, by, on behalf of him. Okay. Cause these are conversations him and I never had 13 year old kids, 14, 15, 16 year old kids, as I was with him, 17. You don't have these kind of talks about divorce and family lives. You know, you just didn't, but that I know because of the Catholic religion, that's difficult, boy. That's like, you have to go get an annulment. All it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, like a failure, right? It's like a sense of failure. And, uh, you know, you're making me get into uncomfortable territory here. Cause I really don't want to talk about too much and, and make him look bad in any way. I don't want to do that. So these are personal questions that really shouldn't be asked publicly, but let's just say that from what we all know, he walked into something. Okay. And I'm not going to go any further than that. I, I don't want to make any kind of smear or anything on, on his family in any way, shape or form. So I don't know. All I know is he was divorced and his family moved out West. That's the extent of it. I did not know he had kids until after he was dead. So you were kind of like his, um, you know, son figure. No, not at all. I was not close to him that way at all. I, I told you this guy's, I told you this before, before we ever did these podcasts, he wasn't a guy that I could talk to like, Hey, I have a problem in school or, Hey, I got a problem with a girl or I want a girl friend or, you know, now Lou Fez, that was different. Okay. Lou, I could talk about it. You know, him and I talked about everything, but with Stanley Rodman, no, I didn't have that kind of relationship with him. Yeah. Um, but I mean, some, some people were kind of like that with their parents, you know, in the, old school yeah. European guys. I mean, I think some fathers and sons were not, wouldn't discuss types of things like that as well. Yeah. Well, I didn't discuss that either with my, my grandparents. Right. But I would, you know, I've had father figures. I, I have, it, and, and he wasn't one of them. And I, again, that's, this is making it sound bad. Like I'm smearing the guy and I'm not, I know how these, these people on the internet like to twist things. He was a great man that gave me what I needed. He gave me, survival skills so i have to be incredibly thankful for the rest of my life about that but i didn't get any like non-fighting direct advice maybe in uh not insignificant insignificantly i don't know what the word is Indir indirectly yeah indirectly i may have picked up things skills you know um on how to handle stuff or you know have that strong mindset of get things done um but i never had the the uh, bond, the first that I can think of kind of bond like that was my first, was my jazz accordion teacher in Cleveland, Ronnie Moon. 
um, that's where we were, we'd go out together, we'd hang out, we'd talk about women and, you know, I, I knew a lot about his life and, you know, all of that, I'd bring him over and cook him breakfast and, you know, after we'd go out and hang out, that, that was a father figure kind of, that's, the, that's what I needed. I needed a buddy. I needed a, that kind of, to me, father, because I didn't have a father. So um, I, I wish it could have been different, but apparently he just was like this with other people too. It wasn't like me. He was very uh, tight lipped and, you know, um, and people knew better than to push. Well, not that he would hurt anybody. Probably. He would just say, shut up. Don't ask me again. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to tell you. You know, so. Well, yeah, considering all he's been through too, you know, it's, it, you can understand why you know, all those things he went through early on in his life, why he'd be guarded. You know, we don't know what it was from his perspective. I mean, you, you know, you felt one way about the relationship, but maybe he did in some ways. Maybe there was, you know, I think, you know, him, know. who knows, you know. All I can tell you is that it, it you know, I'm grateful for, for learning what I've learned and thankful for that. And, and, while we're at it, there, there were other people that reached out to me, old timers that showed me tricks and things and stuff. And I don't want to say that their contribution didn't mean anything because they did. Like I said, a couple of weeks ago, or whenever it was a month ago about my friend's dad that came over that one time and first technical martial art lesson I ever got. Who knows that that really was inspirational to me. I still talk about it now. And that's 50 years ago or maybe not 50 years ago, 45, 50, whatever. I was like 10, you know, something like that. Well, however you are, old you are when you're in like the fourth grade, okay? Or fifth grade, whatever it was. So like, I'm, I'm like really, you know, grateful to that. And, you know, Ray Jablonski down the street or Mr. Jennings on the other street that would, would show me things now and then um, that stuck with me, you know, that these were more like, uh, combat guys you know like world war ii guys i know ray jablonski was mr jablonski was in the marines he was a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor in the marines world war ii um hated buddy rich by him for that and that's another story for another time but um and then mr jennings may not have been in world war ii but he he was probably korea uh, i don't recall he could have been world war ii um but I, I don't know why I want to think he was maybe just a little bit younger, not much, maybe in his 50s. So he, he could have been either one. But yeah, they would show me things that they learned in the service, um, you know, to help to help me out. And then, of course, all the guys that showed me boxing, you know, including my grandfather, who was the first one to, you know, show me stuff. They all contributed in in a certain way. So to all of them, I'm very you know, grateful. Um, and it, I think too, it, it broadened my horizons. It, it made me see more than just like one style. So like I learned the, the boxing and then I learned the wrestling and then I learned the kicking and the martial art kind of stuff. So I was a little more well-rounded than most people back in that day. Not everyone, a lot, there were others that knew, you know, this, there's a fallacy that Bruce Lee was the first one to do all this. And that's absolutely not true. There were so many cross-trained people before Bruce Lee. You know, many, especially in America, many guys knew how to box and wrestle. Um, and then if they went into the service, they learned some, you know, karate kind of, you know, kicks or, you know, what what, what have you. So there were guys that, you know, that were, were cross-trained. So that wasn't a new concept. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I told you guys, I never saw a Bruce Lee movie in my life until I think I was a senior in high school. So I never even knew anything about Bruce Lee. I just knew his name, you know, and, and then I used to research martial arts. So I would read books and go to the library and, you know, just take out books and read. Um, and um, I can actually remember seeing the Tao of Jeet Kune Do and pointing out some of the mistakes that Bruce Lee was doing when he came to the grappling. Like, yeah, he's, this isn't right. This isn't right. He doesn't do this right. Um, but I couldn't comment at the time about his Wing Chun or any of the Jeet Kune Do stuff because obviously I never studied that. But, but yeah, I 
I, I'm, I'm thankful to everyone who tried to show me stuff. Who was the um, the wrestling coach you had? I think it was in one of the high schools. That was George Atwell. I think so. Yeah, you mentioned him. Yeah, you had some good stories with him too, right? Well, he's. I'm sure. I don't know if he's still with us, but uh, he was the kind of guy that you wanted to prank, okay? Um, because he was. And he talked nasally like that. He had that you know nasal kind of uh, sound, and um, well, he's another one who boxed and wrestled. As a matter of fact. Uh, he was, he was old back then. He was about ready to retire. So I would put him at least early, if not late sixties, when I was about 14 or 15, maybe 15. Um, so he had about 50 years on me. Uh, and he was the type of guy that hated everyone. I mean, Hack and Schmidt, fake, which he was in a way. Uh, gotch, you know, all these, he just, he was old school, man. He, and he, he didn't necessarily, wasn't a submission guy. I mean, he, of course he knew cranks, you know, all those old timers wrestlers that were seriously halfway decent and knew some cranks, but, uh, yeah, he was just a, you know, like, he was a gym teacher is what he was. I don't know what else. I only had him for one year. So I, I don't know anything about him other than he was another world war two guy. And he used to claim to be a hot shot pool player as well, which I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he was or wasn't, <laughs> but he was interesting. But yeah, he used to use me as a demonstrator. He would like to demonstrate on me, you know, in gym class, the wrestling moves. And he would come down on me hard. He did once he did a head and arm and he came down hard on my ribs and he was, I was still thin. And he was not, you know, um, he was pretty husky, probably 200 pounder then, you know, and uh, yeah. And he's another one. I, I guess I kind of, I was kind of like him where he would demonstrate a hold and be discussing it while not relinquishing it on me. Kind of like I did to Bruce on a lost art of hooking. <laughs> it kind of sucks. Yeah, I, have, I, I don't, there, yeah, there were some interesting stories about him. I, again, I don't want to share a lot of this publicly like this because, you know, it, it, it can make somebody look bad. But every story that I have, and I don't have that many about him, but they they were all good. <laughs> and, it, you know, may, may look, make, it may look other, may, it may make other people look not so good. He was tough. That, that was a guy that was tough. He knew how to fight. And we Did saw one. Did he ever see you do catch wrestling moves? Uh, I think he he did, um, and that's kind of like. And then he's asking me why am I doing this? Where where are you learning all this? You know, he he think he thought all pro wrestling shit was bullshit. Okay, and I'm like, but well, here, Mr. Atwell, here, let me let me show you. Well, no, I wasn't allowed to do that. You know, he didn't want me to put a prank on him or anything like that. Um, but he was cantankerous. He was another one that was just, he was very arrogant. He was very full of himself in that regard. I shouldn't say full of himself, but just very proud. He was a proud guy. And, um, you know, who knows? He may have had some run-ins with like pro wrestlers in the past. And I'm sure that, you know, he was able to handle himself quite well if, if that indeed happened. I don't know. I'm speculating. But, um yeah, no, he was uh, he was just another one of those guys that just it was rare that he would ever give a compliment to anybody. This has got nothing to do with me, but there were kids in a, in a gym class, you know, that I thought were pretty doggone good athletes, and he would never, to my memory, ever give anybody a compliment. He was always, you know, knocking everybody. I had a lot of people like that, man, up until. I had an English teacher in 11th grade who was in the greatest human being I ever, ever met, you know, at that point in my life. And she was the first person that ever, you know, cared, showed that she cared. All my other teachers were, you know, not really interested. Mean. I went to Catholic school, man, up until 10th grade. 
you know, anybody who's gone to Catholic school out there knows what it was like when you had nuns, especially, okay? The nuns, <clears throat> man, I mean, they punished you, physically punished you, kneeling on rice, hitting your hands with rulers and, and things like that. And just, you know, it was punishment always. It was, it was a whole horrible upbringing. And then in my ninth grade, I went to an all boys school, but was still Catholic. And they had, you know, it was strict, you know, paddlings and all this shit. You know, this was not a place, you know, um, and my ninth grade was terrible uh, because I was a, one of the poorest kids in that school. And I'm not going to mention the name. It's a very famous school. And they've, they've had some super famous people went to that high school. And uh, it was a money school, man. You know, if you had money, you know, uh, you you got treated a lot differently than us poor kids, you know, and they know when you're poor because we used to get vouchers, food vouchers, like government issued food vouchers. So they know who the kids are that are, you know, basically on welfare. They know who they are. You can't lie. You can't hide, hide it. You know, so um, yeah, it was that. It was just, you know, really, you know, a bad experience there. And then then I, in 10th grade, I went to public, 10th, 11th, and 12th, I went to public school, and, um, you know, I, I liked it better. I've, I've heard a lot of stories, like my dad telling me about Catholic school, like that, the nurses giving out beatings and all kinds of, like, crazy discipline, um, but yeah, that's something that I don't think would fly today. Yeah, we didn't have nurses, but we, I had a good education and I was a smart kid. Did I say nurses? I meant nuns. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you no, know, he it was nuns. Yeah, the the nuns were tough. I mean, I mean, seriously. Uh and you know, and we 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 my first through sixth grade, it should have been first through eighth grade, but they canceled, they closed the school permanently after my sixth grade. But we had um uh, we had how did it go? I had first grade, and then the, the enrollment was so small. We had combined classes, like fourth, fifth, and sixth grade were combined. Okay, because um, there just wasn't enough kids. And in seventh and eighth grade was combined. Um, I never made it to seventh and eighth grade. As I said, after my sixth grade year, they closed the school. Then I got. Then I ended up enrolling in a different. Um, uh, Catholic school for seventh and eighth grade, which was in a completely different neighborhood. And while I did have a couple of friends, that was very rough because I was an outsider. Okay, I'm coming in all of a sudden in seventh grade and I'm an Italian kid and I'm not from that neighborhood. You know, that was, um, that was not, a, that wasn't a pleasant experience either. You know, and I had some bullshit with the kids in that school and, uh, what really wasn't a nice, you know, I did not have a good, uh, school wasn't good, you know, um, but my first through sixth grade, that was basically in my neighborhood. I wish, I want Joe and I to go to Cleveland and you, you could, the school's still standing, even if they tore it down, you, you could see out where it was from where my house was. Horrible. Uh, we had to walk uh, five, six blocks or something like that. It sounds not far, but it took a while and it was dangerous. You know, it's, it's, you know, I'll let you guys walk it. Even today, walk it. I'll drop you off where the house was and you walk to where the school is and then walk back. You'll, you'll be like <laughs> paying attention. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, you know, who wants this kind of crap? You know, it's just, but in the end, you know, it, it is what it is. I'm sure there's people out there who went through worse. There's people who never made it home from school. It happened anywhere, but all in all, um, you know, I, I think things started to change, uh, you know, it, probably in 11th grade for me. That's when, you know, I everything started to come together. I, I could wrestle pretty good. I didn't talk about it. I kept, kept all my stuff pretty much to myself, except for my speed, my running, my playing sports. Um, cause we did, we did a lot of that in, in 11th and 12th grade. 
And that's a very interesting, that school's closed now um, as well. All, all of my history is being taken away from me. All, you know, my, my ninth grade school will never close. That school will be around in the year 3000. It'll still be here. It's, it is a very, uh, it's one of the top three schools in the city of Cleveland for parochial schools for sure. And um, yeah, it'll be around for a long time. They probably have an endowment or what is that called when you have money? What's that called? Like when a school has money from, from former students and stuff, what's that called? I don't know. I can't remember. But so I think it's like an endowment or something like that. Mm. Endowment, like like Harvard probably has five hundred million dollars or maybe more. Who knows? You know, I would assume that this school has a lot. You know, because many of of the graduates were, you know, um, politicians, professional athletes. I think even movies, Hollywood actors. I think, you know, um, you'd be surprised how many people went to this school. I just found out recently um, that uh, there's another famous politician who's out on the West Coast that actually went to one of the rivals high schools in Cleveland, um, which was surprising. I didn't know the guy that this, this uh, politician was from, from Cleveland. But yeah, he went to school in Cleveland, moved out to California and whatever. But what by that clock on the wall, buddies, I guess we should probably be wrapping this one up. All right. Well, yeah, it's good to get to talk to you guys. And I think some good more stories came out today. So it was a good, good one. Yeah, the the we'll, we'll, we should focus on um I liked your question before Nico showed up about the, 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 you know, if I had a blank check, how would I train people? You know, that's, that's really a good thing. You know, if you look at it as a boot camp, well, you got to look at it not as a boot camp per se, like you're going to learn everything in 13 weeks. No, but you, you know, if you could earmark a year or two years or three years, whatever, you know, you, you, you have to, learn these techniques okay and unfortunately like boxing most good boxers start as a kid and they move through the ranks you know so when they get like let's say they turn pro and now they're they're going to joe blow's gym well they know pretty much all the fundamentals right they're just going to learn little tidbits and and work on their conditioning and their sparring and all of that but with me i'd have to teach them everything you know i'd have to start from square one you know because they'd be uh, you know, getting techniques here that, you know, they, they, you can't get anywhere. So, um, you know, that's, that's where it gets, that's where it's more, um, time consuming, you know, it, it, it'd it be harder training. Sure. There's a lot of different scenarios. I mean, if someone comes to you with a strong wrestling background, they've already got a big jump start, you know, and conditioning and some of the fundamentals. I mean, there might be some stuff they'll have to unlearn, but still, I mean, at least you don't have to cover that stuff. So there's a lot of like interesting permutations we could go on this kind of this question line of questioning, you know, uh, you know, if, if you're starting someone from ground zero, how do you build them up? But if they already like, an, or in a scenario where it's like, okay, they've already got the conditioning down now, you know, we're going to spend the next year preparing for a sequence of fights. How would, how would I, you know, train them that way too. So you've got someone, two different levels, you know, how do I mold someone from ground zero as opposed to how do I, you know, you know, if we had like a, a, a fighter and like a stable of fighters and you wanted to like, you know, go through a, a year or two of, uh, you know, different competitions, how would you, and again, this is all hypothetical, you know, in an idealized world where they don't have to work a job or things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of interesting things we could delve into in future episodes. Yeah, there's so many what ifs. You know, what is your training? What is your bag? Just because you're a wrestler doesn't mean you're good. Just because you're a wrestler, it, how are you on the mat? Or how exposed are you? Or if you're a boxer, are, are you a knockout artist? Or, you know, can you take a punch? Yeah, there's so much, you know, that you'd have to, yeah, there, it's just, everyone's an individual you know that's the thing you'd have to get to know them and feel them out so to speak but yeah uh yeah that's something we could always just delve into as fun you know because that's all it is it's just pure speculation everybody's different 
Cool. Well, you guys have a, a good rest of your Sunday and a good rest of your week. Yeah, Are you too good? Too. Yeah. Good talking to you. Good seeing you again, Nico. Good seeing you. All right. All right, guys. See ya. Thank you.